of Mohammed, I, I think they are right, you know, because um, <laughs> when when you look when you look or have as I have looked at the history of these people and the times that they lived in, they meant certain things and they did certain things which I can prove that uh, this man I'm going to introduce you today to you today and many others are doing and if men such as him had lived during those times maybe a few of us would be worshipping them in these days so without any further ado I give you now Professor John understanding how to get on the road back to ourselves because we who are lost in the West are lost from the concept of nation next. And in my recent trip to Africa through Senegal, Ghana, and the Ivory Coast, and I purposely visited these countries because they are contradictions. Yeah. And had I visited other countries, I would have found the same contradictions because Africa, every country, is somewhat of a contradiction in case in confusion because Africa was on the right track was on the right road leading to home and someone disturbed and confused the people on that road. Something happened. And what something happened is that after the independence explosion the independence of Ghana, the enemies of Ghana and the enemies of Africa laid back and planned. And the plan was not just against Ghana. The plan was against the whole of the African world. And when the plan was put in operation, it moved against the whole of the African world. It moved against black America, it destroyed the civil rights movement, it destroyed the concept of a West Indian Federation, and it destroyed the concept of a Pan-African Africa. And it destroyed it because we, as a people, have been historically naive about protecting ourselves, and we have never known the people who came out of Europe, and we have been always transferring some of our humanity to them, and we cannot accept the fact that they came out of a thought, out of ice box, and they lacked humanity, and that our humanity has never been their humanity, that we look at the world entirely different, and yet you got whole lot of black people hung up with the concept that, well, all people are black, we are all just human beings, you know. That is not the truth. That was never the truth. When you look at a European where power is concerned, he is an evil genius. He will stop at nothing. And 
the two things you can depend on the Europeans absolutely never to fracture is Christianity and democracy. Because you believe in those things because they are decent things, they are human things, and because you came out of a society that practiced them long before the first European wore a shoe or lived in a house that had a window, you believe he has the capacity to practice those things. He came out of a thought out icebox called Europe. And he was drained of the sentimental temperament to practice them before you saw him. Now, you, I said the talk is about Marcus Garvey, Booker T. Washington, and self-reliance. I'm on the subject, and I'm going to stay on it. <laughs> but you've got to know what you've got to deal with in the world. Because we are a world people who have been programmed into thinking that we are a minority. A minority has conned us into thinking that we are a minority. <laughs> and we are a world people. Then before we can even talk about self-reliance, we have to talk about self. Who are we? Who are we in the world? Our hands, and how do we let a handful of people con us into thinking that we are dependent on them? When we have more resources than they have. Recently, when a Japanese prime minister made some remarks about African Americans and Spanish Americans lowered the intellectual profile of the United States, black Americans got so angry they want to boycott, they want to do this, they want to stop buying Toros and stop buying Dotsons and, and Sunni. That's the absolutely wrong thing to do. You've got a land mass called Africa, 50 times the size of the Japanese land mass. You've got more people than they've got. You've got more resources than they've got. 200 years ago, they didn't even have a wheelbarrow. <laughs> then, study what did they what did they do to become the technical masters of the modern world? No boy got nothing. You want to tell us buy. You want a Dobson buy. Take a Dobson apart and take one of your your young men and say, all right, I want you to make the hub cap, you to make this one with you. I don't want any of you to stop until you make every part of that car. Then I want you to put it all together. Then it's yours. Once you learn how to make every part of it, then you make it Dawson, then you can buy them from yourself. Now, maybe you call them Dawson daddy yo, but you will <laughs> <laughs> do what they do. I'm still talking about self-reliance. I ain't gonna talk about nothing but self-reliance. <laughs> you get angry with them for having a doctor. I get angry with you for not making a doctor because they're no more geniuses than you are. They got two eyes, two, one mouth, one nose, two feet, and a brain. You got the same thing and can do the same thing. You had more than they when they started. They didn't even have a wheelbarrow, a watch, a nut. An agrarian people who didn't want to be technical. Some arrogant racist American named Perry went over there and kicked open the door and told those people, trade with the Western world, whether you like it or not. 
They said, huh, well, I guess that's what we're going to have to do. <laughs> and they sent that children to study in Western school, generation after generation. Finally, they learned how to make a camera. They took tote, tore one apart, and studied every little part of it. Then they finally made it, and they started making more. Then they had a, then they, every little Japanese came to the United States had a camera. And he was just taking pictures of all the buildings, taking pictures of all the trains, taking pictures of all the toys, and they became great toy makers. Taking pictures of the gun. By 1905, they made guns so well, they jumped on Russia and beat the living hell out of Russia. <laughs> They were buying guns. Now they were making guns. Don't boycott. Don't get angry with these people. Study what they did to come from an agrarian nation without a wheelbarrow to become the leading technical nation of the world. And find out why you, a great market, you feed two billion dollars into the American economy Every year, you spend a half a million dollars on potato chips, and you don't have a potato chip factory, and you can make potato chips in your stove, um, in your kitchen. You can start a potato chip factory in a basement. All right, I made a comparison some time ago at Bank Street College in a memorial for, in a tribute to Martin Luther King. I had been a key speaker the previous year. Then the next year I was just going to preside over a workshop and make extemporaneous remarks. So the extemporaneous remark, they didn't have no control of what I had to say, so I thought I would say something about what Martin Luther King did not learn about Mahatma Gandhi. And so I said that, suppose Martin Luther King really had understood Mahatma Gandhi. He could have turned the economy of this country around. He could have turned black America around. And so I said, Suppose he had stood in public before his, his black constituency and took off all his clothes except his underwear and told them, my, pe my people, I will wear no clothes except that which you make for me. I will never wear wool again until you make wool. The sheep must come from your farm. I'll never wear cotton until the cotton comes from your field and your factory. I said, he, he would have given us an economy. I'll never wear any shoes that you don't make. Never wear any suit that you don't make. Now you know we got some good tailors and Mars would have gotten the best suit in the first suit. <laughs> <laughs> he would have been sharp. <laughs> he didn't have nothing to worry about. We got some shoemakers that really will give Martin some shoes. He even he, 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 he look like the sharpest thing in town. Then I tell you what, at what point when the ladies came to the podium and, 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 and told me that that's enough, that's enough, Professor Cloud. This is not the kind of program. This is a tribute. I said, suppose we, he said to us. Our beloved ones will not be buried in a coffin we don't make. We'd have to open 10 coffin factories. Then the mafia will no longer control the coffin industry. <laughs> Any good coffin that can make a coffin. It's the most overpriced item in the human industry. It's not even good wood if you look at the coffin. It's not even good wood that they put third grade wood in it and cover it up with junk. Charge you a thousand dollars. You touch, your blood one is dead, you don't feel like all you want to buy. You just shell out the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
And let's make the coffins and shell it out to us. <laughs> Without the economy, we would be begging. We could keep the black universities open. We could better have black Harvard and Cambridge, Oxford. We don't, we, that's self-reliance. That's all I'm going to talk about all these. Self-reliance. Take care of your own. Make your own money, manage your own money, spend your own money on yourself. We are a nation, within a nation in this country, searching for a nationality. And once we find our nationality and serve that nationality, we'll do for ourselves what needs to be done. All ethnic groups in this country understand they got a nationality because you answer to such stupid words like Negro and color and black. You have no nationality. Negro is not a nationality. Some lazy Portuguese or Spaniard took an adjective and made a noun out of it. Color is not a nationality. Black tells you how you look, but it don't tell you who you are. That's right. Come on, the name of a people must relate them instantaneously to land, history, and culture. And any time you call a people by that right name, any time you call a people and name a people and fail to relate them by to land, history, culture, you have called them out of their name. <laughs> There's no black land or black hole of it. There's nothing wrong with the word black. Nothing wrong with it at all. Only it doesn't relate to a country. The name of every people in the world relate to country. And once you think instantaneously of land, you think of nationality. <coughs> you belong to something big in the world. Now, you take the West Indies, South America, Brazil alone has 60 million African people declare 20 million confused, mixed, and undeclared. That's 80 million African people. Yes, in Brazil alone. Now, you've probably got 200 million African people in the Western world. You've got, in the Pacific, you've got millions of African people. You've got about a half a million in Australia, called Aborigines. Aborigine just means the original. It's not even an offensive word, although when white people use it, it's offensive. Then there's a neighboring island called Tasmania that once had all African people and not even mixed with Polynesia. The ones in Australia were mixed with Polynesia. But there was a neighboring island called not mixed with Polynesia. <coughs> The British killed everyone, every man, woman, and child in Tasmania. There's not a single Tasmanian alive. There's not even a witness alive. The killers are alive, but all the Tasmanians were killed to the last man, woman, and child. You know you're talking about the Tasmanians? They are no more. But you still, you got uh, 10 million Dravidians in India who now say that they belong to the African world community. They originally came from Africa and they do belong to the African world community. Now you've got Africa counted as 500 million for the last 50 years, <laughs> implying that the African man is sleeping away from home, not reproducing himself, which is not true. In the 21st century, there will be 
a billion African people on the face of the earth. Now, a billion people don't necessarily need any friends or allies. Right. Once a billion people make an ally out of themselves, they are automatically a world power. Mm -hmm. Now, let's think about it. Food for a billion people, shirts for a billion people, shoes for a billion people, ships to carry goods and services for a billion people all over the world. A whole union of African people taking care of each other all over the world. Who else do they need other than themselves? And anybody want to make an ally of us, they would have to make an ally on our terms. <laughs> all the gold, the manganese in our, in our hands now, of course. We're talking about the management of our wealth. So we got to need a whole, to, to, to master this form of self-reliance, you have to have a whole new educational system. And you have to now master the one kind of education that has been kept away from you. The education that leads to nation management. The one kind of education no one wants you to have. How to manage a nation. Now you're talking about the freedom of South Africa. You're fighting for it the wrong way. You're thinking about it the wrong way. South Africa produces one of the largest quantities of gold in the world. How many people do you have who can refine gold? I'm not a gorilla fighter. Who's going to refine the gold? How many people do you have who's going to market the gold? Are you going to be independent like Zimbabwe? When most of the personnel that control the country are still white? You've got, got a university with only one department headed by blacks, and his staff is white. The economy is still run by white. What kind of independence is that? If they've been trained in self-reliance, blacks would have taken over immediately. And Iron Smith, who disrupted the government, would have been home the first day. <laughs> Self-reliance means in control of your destiny, all of it. Also means knowing how to defend yourself in your own country. Africa has been a continent, it's been without defense, most of its existence. Conquerors have literally walked into Africa and for 3,000 years, longer, but let's just deal with 3,000 years. For 3,000 years, it has been under siege. Under siege because African people throughout the world have always had something that other people wanted, thought they couldn't do without, and didn't want to pay for. And this condition still exists. All right, now, essentially, this is what Booker T. Washington and Marcus God was trying to say to us about self-denial. All of this leads to examining these two men and what they were saying about self-reliance. And have we understood Booker T. Washington and Marcus Garvey, we would today be prepared to manage nations. And if you are going to rehearse to manage a nation, you must first manage a community. Because the community is a small nation. All right, now, we have to look at the time and the age of Booker T. Washington and look what led up to the period of Booker T. Washington 
he emerged at the end of the 19th century. And we have to look at that 19th century. We have to look at the black man, this African of the 19th century, all over the world, because you have forgotten the fact that the 19th century African all over the world especially the 19th century African outside of Africa, was the supreme, the best African that we have produced outside of Africa. Until we go back and understand his bravery and his magnificence in the nature of his revolution, we won't understand him in the 20th century. Because he was consistently in revolt. Now let's go back, let's look at the revolt in the Caribbean and in South America and how they related to these other revolts because what they were fighting for was self-reliance and nationness. And these revolts would relate to other, other revolts because they understood that the slavery system now had become an unwieldy system. And the slaveholders and the colonialists were about to change that system from chattel slavery to another system more sophisticated called colonialism. You have to understand that slavery was never abolished, it was transformed that it still exists. They merely transformed it from one set of system to the another. Now they're computerized. <laughs> God, Jesus. But it, it goes on. It, it goes on. All right. In the Caribbean, in South America, they fought better because they had a culture continuity. They had a culture continuity because the slave masters in the Caribbean, in South America, bought in large lots and kept the lots together. Not because they loved anybody. They thought they could work them better that way. They were right. But the one thing the slave master forgot, they could fight better that way. They maintained something in that era that all people have to have in order to make nations, in order to make revolutions cultural confidence and historical memory. Mm -hmm. The one thing we have lost all over the world today, the crisis in the whole of the African world, all over the world, is the loss of cultural confidence and historical memory. When you take that away from a people, you don't have to build in jail. You got it. They are slaves. And any person that loses respect for his culture, loses his historical memory, and loses confidence in his own culture, and anybody that turns on his old God, and accept the gods of a slave master Amen. is a slave. So we rise to <laughs> He can ride in a Mercedes and he can live in a penthouse. But he's still a slave. I hear you. You want a good example? A multi million dollar multi-millionaire, little black boy turning white, chemically. <laughs> One of the saddest slaves we've got. She changed her own, his mind. <laughs> he is <laughs> he has no historical memory. No, he has no cultural confidence no, in himself. 
I would say he was brainwashed if I believed he had a brain. <laughs> but the strength of the people in the Caribbean and in South America is that in spite of slavery, they still had culture confidence and historical memory. And this brought them together, they formed slave revolts, and in South America, especially Brazil, separate African communities called Colombos, and the revolt in Brazil led to the making of a separate city, a separate African country, Palmeira, and another one, Bahia. Now, at the end of the 19th century, the mind of the Caribbean and in South America, the perspective of the Caribbean, the mind was no different from that of African people throughout the world, it was just as confused. Because by the end of the 19th century, through brainwashing, they were black English. Black Englishmen and defending British culture in the Anglican church, like any other Englishmen, and probably more so. Because they had forgotten their African gods, they had given up their African ways. And any time an oppressor makes you laugh at your old God and take on his new God and his God is dressed, he's got you again. So, in Africa itself, there was awakening early in the century that Africans had to get back those things that belonged to them. And so, for a hundred years, they didn't negotiate nothing. They went to the field, picked up their steels, and picked up their weapons and their shields, and went to the field of battle and tried to regain what was taken away from them. But at the end of that hundred years, modern equipment, beaten down, so many of that people bought off, brainwashed by missionaries, at the end of the 19th century, the inroad that has been made on them and their concept of self-reliance was missionaryism and cop-outism and brainwashed by the Western educated African. The Western educated African and his misconceptions of education might be the greatest enemy Africa had. Some of them came back and served well. Some of them came back and challenged those who educated. Some of them used British education to question the presence of the British. But like today, some of them used Western education to become more Western than Westerners and to take on Western clothes Western manner and another contradiction, Western women. Go up there, brother. I hear you. They're not African anymore. No, sir. They don't even have, eat African food anymore. <laughs> they go to supermarkets. The natural food of Africa doesn't suit them anymore. <laughs> All right, now, my main point is that once you forget your gods, your customs, yes. your loyalty system, you are no longer relying on the culture that produced you, but the culture that oppressed you, once you place that above the culture that produced you, then you are a prisoner mm -hmm. to another culture. 
identity, and you are reliant on that culture, no longer on yourself. This is the training of Africans to be dependent and in Africa itself. All right, now, in the United States, leading to the era of Booker T. Washington and the era of Marcus Darwin, blacks had fought physically well throughout the first of the 19th century. Now, the second half of the 19th century, after the Civil War, and the pseudo-independence, pseudo-democracy that followed up into the betrayal of the Reconstruction, 1875-1876. Now at the end of, we have to study that period, 1876, up into the emergence of Booker T. Washington. During that period, the white abolitionists had left uh, our cause. They said they've done that, that bit. John Brown is gone. We've only got two people in, in Congress, Sumner, Thaddeus Stevens. Thaddeus Stevens has given the vote and let him make his own right. Sumner, give him 40 acres and a mule. Let him make his own way. Didn't get the vote acres, didn't get the mule. <laughs> didn't get the vote either. Okay. The guys have boxed in some. Alright, then they couldn't find nothing on Thaddeus Stevens, and then they finally discovered that for a number of years he'd been sleeping with a black woman. Then they had it. Boom. <laughs> then they destroyed his credibility. So now. The two white defendants we've got in Congress gone. The effectiveness of black congressmen has been destroyed. So, when we come to the era of Booker T. Washington, many whites had become so rich in the United States, they got more money than they had to count, than they could count, and they had to give away some of it to spend it down so they could count it. <laughs> now they're a bunch of thugs <laughs> and they've sent their daughters to the finest schools in Europe and they can't even have the solid form. <laughs> they have no social graces and no social acceptance. So they go to white public relations men so how do you get accepted in this society? I mean, nobody pays any attention. They know, they know they got their money by stealing people or knocking people over the head. Uh, Grovey Vanderbilt's uh, father got his money by, he was a fur trapper. At least he was a man that he went to somebody else to set a trap to catch the bear out of Vanderbilt. Then he steals the fur out of somebody else's trap. <laughs> that was the beginning of Gloria Vanderbilt's grandfather's fortune. Mm -hmm. oh, geez, because you sell kids. What, what all these thugs, the melons and the Carnegies, they wanted a reputation. Now, they wanted some cleansing. So the Rockefellers wanted some cleansing. So the Rockefellers had a daughter named Spellman, and who Unfortunately, didn't have a child, poor thing. <laughs> so she had a lot of money that her husband left her, and so she thought she would give her money to establish a college for Negro girl. So she started Spelman College. <laughs> Connie gave away some libraries. The Rockefeller started the general education fund, which now becomes the Negro College Fund. <laughs> There were some lesser known millionaires, the Foster Peabody's and, and some others. In other words, by the time Booker T. Washington emerged, the Rockefellers were giving away money to blacks, mainly to keep them out of the Ivy League schools in the North. And they got tired of dealing with multiplicity of leaders and they wanted to get, give the money through one leader. So now they decided to create a black leader. 
is a book devised on the creation of white philanthropy and white editorial right. And why they've been creating our leaders since then, they can make them and they can break them. Washington was a creation of that. He rendered some great service. Mm -hmm. And don't call people who call him an Uncle Tom wrong. Mm -hmm. People who think he compromised all the time. He was wrong. All right. Now, they're going to give him a lunch. He's done some brilliant work. He's taken a little sleepy run-down school there at Tuskegee. He's really rebuilt it. And he enters Tuskegee, following a concept of self-reliance. Many young men wanted an education so bad they would walk across three states to get to Tuskegee. And when they get there, they have no shoes. So he opened shoe repair shops. Then finally he opened shoe design shop. So he's beginning to do practical things. So now we begin to see the practicality of the education from Tuskegee. He began to open cooks and bakery schools. And the schools he opened for cooks and bakers are so good that the government of the United States is sending cooks from the U.S. Army to study cooks and bakers, study at the cooks and bakers school at Tuskegee. And this went on right straight through the Second World War. And, but now after the war, blacks who wasn't in the army did start looking down at that kind of labor, which was the, the worst thing they ever did, because a good cook now and a good baker now makes more money than a college professor. I hate go on teach, man. Go on teach. <laughs> But, but now, Tuskegee no longer has a cooks and baker school because black don't attend them. <laughs> but Booker D. Washington set up practical schools to teach practical skills that you needed to build a nation with. Mm. Mm. That though created by white philanthropy, he was the most practical black educator we've ever produced in this country. And the conflict around him should never have occurred. We should have understood him. Instead of opposing one thing against the other, we should have put a combination of two things together. Well, now let's look at the making of Booker T. Washington, the launching of Booker T. Washington by the whites. How the whites were going to give him his public press. They're going to make him the key speaker at the Atlanta Cotton Expedition. He goes to the Cotton Expedition. He's still grieving the death of the greatest black leader we produced in the whole of the 19th century, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass is dead now. Frederick Douglass only died a few months before he made that speech. Or right, Frederick Douglass, the, 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 the giant, is, the, the mantle now is open. The mantle of leadership is open. The so Booker D. Washington go to the Atlanta Cotton Expedition. And though he is the guest speaker, he has to come through a Jim Crow door and wait in the Jim Crow section until it's his time to speak. Okay. Then he mounts the when he mounts the the uh, the rostrum, some white person calls out, what's that nigga doing on that stage? <laughs> 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 oh, <do you> <laughs> Finally, he gets up to speak. And Booker T. Washington's Atlanta Cotton Expedition speech should be read by every black person to try to understand. I used to read it once each year and find something new each time. Because I've grown because it was a test of my own growth and my own ability to understand. This speech was all things to all people. 
He was speaking to the South, the White South and Black South, and he's speaking to the North who owned the South then and now. <laughs> God, please, brother. Then he was jiving everybody. It was a con game, too. <laughs> then he was telling the blacks that it's best to uh, earn a dollar a day than to sit next to white at the opera. That pleased the white. He got a little bit in the feet that soothed everybody along. In other words, we won't bother you. We won't sit next to you at the opera, but give us a job. He was telling the South, the Southern, the uh, Northerners who own the industry of the South, that we won't strike like those immigrant ingrates up north. The immigrant labor was just coming in now in large numbers. It was really anti-immigrant speech. He was giving those the, uh, the assurance. And he was telling blacks that you should open up, you should have a, a garden or a truck farm other than going around making stump political speeches. Mm. He was saying the politics can wait. Let's take care of first things first. Nothing wrong with that so long as he explained what it means. But he didn't explain what it means. Then his great clincher to the south. There's a, there's a little show of everybody now. You should read this speech. He tells the south, it was we who were faithful to you. It is we who stood by you. And in time we have followed you with tear dripped eyes to your grave. That's true. Some blacks have been so large and white they followed and cried to the grave. So massive to the grave. <laughs> No member of the family crying as much as a black church. Uh, See, Booker White the new sentiment. He was playing on everybody's sentiment. Then his great venture. All things that make for progress. We can be uh, as together as the church, you know. Mm. Then he was talking about in social things. We can be as divided as the thing there. Hey. Hey. But for social progress, we can be like the thing. Together, man, white love happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we ain't gonna sit the next piece at the movie or the show. <laughs> that was interpreted as meaning his endorsement of segregation. Whether he meant it or not, there's nothing. That, that interpretation of it. All right, he finishes his speech. Some white woman throws flowers at his feet. <laughs> President of the United States sends out a telegram. All this was staged, you know, it was a good scenario. <laughs> Governor Cleveland or somebody at the end with him, white editorial writers jumped on the case, and the next morning, Booker D. Washington became the lead of Black America. Mm. <laughs> they like it, huh? They said so. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> if a black man wanted a street car conduct a job in tennis in Cincinnati, the white folks wanted to know, is it all right with Booker? <laughs> Booker T. Washington became the dictator of black America. Mm -hmm. And he developed what was called the Tuskegee Machine. The next year, a light-skinned black man got on a train in New Orleans. It so happened that the conductor, the white conductor, knew his family and knew he had a little bit of us in him, although he was light enough to pass for white, but that particular conductor hadn't been home, he would just been accepted as another white man on a train. So that conductor knew that he had some black in him. This started the President versus Ferguson case. When this case went to the Supreme Court, the decision of 
separate but equal was a noun. And the separate never became equal. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. But the rash of Jim Crow laws from the time Booker D. Washington made the speech, 1895, up until 1900, most of the stringent, silly, stupid Jim Crow laws were passed, including the law in Mississippi that no black woman should, could appear in midtown without an apron indicating she was a maid. No matter what state that she was. Ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Mm. And I know in my hometown, Columbus, Georgia, many black women who wanted to see a decent movie in the white theater merely put on a maid's uniform and grabbed a little white boy and said that she was his nurse and paid for both of them and went into the movie <laughs> and broke the Jim Crow law because if she was his nurse or his guardian, the keeper for the day, because it was a custom of the guardianship of white, white even young white men, I mean young I mean teenagers. I mean the white woman would leave you in, in care as the baby said, I mean 12 and 13 years old. And so, I mean, so white didn't question when they see a maid sitting by a white girl of that age group. So we broke the color line that way. I mean, the same as uh, I broke the color line in the library by just always writing a note, or writing and posing a white person's name on a piece of paper and said, give this boy certain books. <laughs> I had a whole lot of books from White Library. Why wasn't he supposed to go? <laughs> so one day, the, uh, a white man whose name I told just showed up in the library at the same time I was supposed to go. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing there. I never saw him read a book. I don't know. <laughs> but be that as it may. Now, <laughs> because of the focus, on this, this event in Booker T. Washington's life, we quite forget that this man, in the period leading to the opening of the 20th century, was building a great institution. Of course, he was the dictator of black America. He had a spy system spying on blacks who differed with the Booker T. Washington approach. Mm -hmm. In all fairness, this has to be said. This is why, in 19... 03, when Booker T. when W. B. Du Bois wrote Souls of Black Folk, he would write an article, Mr. Washington and others, different with Booker T. Washington. But a young man, T. Thomas Fortune, became a critic of Booker T. Washington, but a critic and also a supporter. And T. Thomas Fortune became press agent for Booker T. Washington one of the first editors of the New York Age and, and a supporter of Booker T. Washington and a writer of some of Booker T. Washington's uh, speeches. But Booker T. Washington's real critic, Booker T. Washington's critic who gave no quarter, was not Du Bois at all. Monroe Trout of Boston, of the Boston Guardian, that we refer to as the Boston Brahmin. An upper class black man who spared Booker T. Washington nothing. And who always even had a special part of his magazine he called the Booker T. Washington Gym, where he would viciously quote Booker T. Washington. And when Booker T. Washington came to Howard, came to Harvard to make a commencement address and spoke in the community, he broke up the meeting and we'll put in jail. Now this is the man that stayed on Booker T. Washington. Most of Booker T. Washington's career. William Monroe Trotter. He got laws from history. And the only thing some people know him for is the fact that Marvin Trotter, Joe Lewis's 
first wife was his niece. A matter of no significance because I thought it was his first wife was about his brain. This is he has a good looking clothes on with no brain. <laughs> All right, now at the same time, what Booker T. Washington is instituting at Tuskegee is a, is a concept of self-reliance. Self-reliance, he is teaching that if you live in a house, why not own the bricks? Why not not only build the house with your bricks, why not own the brickyard? He noticed that most of the brickyards in the South were people by black. I mean, most of the workers were black. Most of the foremen were black. Well, then he said that if this being the case, you have proven that you can run a brickyard. So how many blacks own a brickyard? Inasmuch as you've proven that you can run one, why not own one? This is self-reliance. This is leading to nation. So Booker T. Washington was on the right track leading to what we have to know in order to rule nations in order to rule nations, then you've got to do everything that a nation requires you to do. In the meantime, Garvey was just growing up in Jamaica, getting things quietly underway. And what gave Garvey his confidence growing up on the most color conscious of the Caribbean island, the most stratified island along color and class line, then and now, Jamaica is the most stratified island along color and class line. It was then and is now. For the British literally set up so many gradations of color and class line until it was possible for a Boston white man, you call him a lefty that you want to, that's your business, <laughs> to come in and take over Jamaica. It's a contradiction that the island had produced Marcus Garvey, would be the only island with a white prime minister. I call him CIA Arthur. <laughs> My point is that what shapes people's ultimate ideals is part of what they grow up around. And when you look at Du Bois, a New England aristocrat, and you can be an aristocrat in New England without having money. If you have family connections and good education connections, you can be considered to be aristocrat to be a good class, you know. You wear your clothes well and you speak your words well and you went to the right Sunday school and you haven't kicked anybody. So you consider to be a nice guy and of a good good quality. Class. He was that kind of class. He had no money, you know. <laughs> Alright, so he was considered to be kind of middle of uh, um, uh, moving to the upper class. Alright. Now then his Frank Kruger background Manner, you know, and he had not um, discovered color prejudice uh, then. And he, white schoolmates, he assumed that he was just as good as they are. Then, <laughs> because he lived in a cooperative town, socialism <clears throat> was very not rampant, but there was a very there was a good, very good, healthy feeling toward socialism in some of the New England towns. So it was a town that was in cooperation. In other words, the people in the town owned the town. And the ten young men who made the highest mark in high school were sent to Harvard at the town's expense. 
And then as much as Du Bois made about the third highest mark, he assumed automatically he was going to Harvard. But they sent the other boys to Harvard. They sent Du Bois to Fitz. Now Du Bois is beginning to discover that there's something in the work called color. <laughs> and that he, there was something that there was something in the work called a race and he belonged to, he don't belong to the same one as the white. So now, down at fifth, he began to discover racial differences and he decided to devote his time to what he called race work. He began to see his people for, for, for the first time. But now he would finish fifth and he wanted to go to Harvard anyway, so he was trying to get to Harvard and, and get to uh, Germany. See, and let's, let's look at the training of both of these two men, and you can understand why they would follow different courses. They would both look at self-reliance, but different ways. And when we look at the training of Marcus Garvey, growing up in Jamaica, becoming a master printer, a craftsman, descendant of the Maroons, the rebels in Jamaica. Now you see the self-confidence. But in Jamaica, some people were a little apologetic about their blackness, because Garvey was a he was known half-black person. He was all the way. <laughs> and he wasn't apologetic about it, but rather smug and proud about it. Then he would not then cringe in the face of a society with mulatto preference. In fact, he would look with disdain on that group. This is why he never understood color prejudice in the United States among blacks. And he never understood that while the British made all those gradations and color separation. Our crew master in the United States put all other than one bag, shook them up, and put one name on the back, nigga. <laughs> <laughs> he had no time for all this separation. Brown society, all moving brown. No, oh, I ain't got to eat. He's too damn lazy to put all of that nonsense. <laughs> well, the British had separate neighborhoods for the almost whites and separate neighborhoods for the brown, separate job category. You are either in, in this country, you are either in or out. <laughs> and you've got one drop of us, so far as they're concerned, you are all the way out. <laughs> God didn't understand. Now, some of us who were like were cop out. And some of us who were like were like national. I hear you, brother. Something which Garvey didn't understand that. And so he would face a divorce later, and he would call him an octoroon or, well, you know, all this. <laughs> <laughs> and he did not know that John Holt at Tuskegee was a blonde, blue-eyed black man who had risked his job, at, or no, not at Tuskegee, but the man he first had risked his job and had passed up $2 million because some white who hated Du Bois and told him, if you don't buy Du Bois, we ain't gonna give you the money. And so John Holt said, keep your money. <laughs> Jeff Du Bois, no principle. And that some of these almost white blacks had just as much principle and took a stronger stand in, in behalf of the people as the blackest of the black. Some of them formed light-skinned society, blue vein society. Some of them formed societies that still intact, based on color. But some of them did not. <clears throat> Marcus Garvey did not understand it. And it took away a lot of time that he could have devoted to other things, mean making the separation and comparing 
American color scheme with the Jamaican color scheme. And these two respective color schemes have never been the same, although both of them are tragic and both of them are unnecessary, but they have never been the same. And they're not the same right now. All right, now, my point here is that when we look at Booker T. Washington in the years before Marcus Garvey came, these were the building years of self-reliance, the building years of Tuskegee, the years when he paid a terrible emotional price to keep his educational machine on course. And if you read his private letters, it will reflect it. Because in his private letters, he was vicious and writing about pre writing to presidents, and yet in his public life, he took a cringing stand. And this is why a lot of people call him Uncle Tom. You read his letters on the Brownsville raid, where in Texas, the, they assigned 3,000 soldiers to a place called Brownsville. When the wife looked around and saw 3,000 soldiers, there was only six black families in town, and they knew soldiers would ultimately act like soldiers and start looking around for some ladies who might say yes or no. And then knowing in the town, they know with six, only six families, only three marriageable, approachable women, black women, that they might start hitting on some of the white women. And so the whites started a campaign to get the blacks out of town. And so they blacken up their face and shout up the town to blame it on the black. So inasmuch they blame it on the blacks, and the blacks are going to be punished for it, the blacks said, the hell with this now, let's go shoot up the town for real. <laughs> <laughs> and so they brought some live ammunition in town including a little small house, a small tank. It's not as big as a regular cannon, but it's, it's big enough. Not a hole in the house, a building. Some of the holes in the building probably are still there. What the black shoot, shot up the town is not the holes in some windows and knocked out some windows, but the whites who were shooting up the town accidentally killed a bartender. Now they would put the blacks on town on, on trial and would hang three and give some 99 years. The last one got out about six years ago. <laughs> this is what Du Bois and Washington went wrong. They asked for clemency. Instead of asking for an investigation, we asked for clemency. That means that, that's the time of asking for mercy. Mm -hmm. The men were not guilty. They, wasn't, they didn't kill anybody. But they did shoot up the town, scare a whole lot of people, you know, people jumping on the beds and, you know, ran. But they, they really didn't kill anybody. But they said, as much as we're going to be accused of shooting up the town, let's, let's go ahead and shoot it up and do a good job. And they did. And they did. But now, Booker T. Washington continues. W.E.B. Du Bois continues. And W.E.B. Du Bois is back from Germany now. He's taught in Wilberforce. This is going too fast, but W.E.B. Du Bois, too, is teaching self-reliance. 1908, Garvey leaves Jamaica, tours uh, South America, Central America. But because of his skill as master printer, he did always finds a job doing something. In addition to his skill of a good gift of gas, and besides there was Caribbean communities scattered throughout Central America. 
Panama. The Panama Canal was built principally by Jamaicans and Barbadians and you know. So he could find a lot of Caribbean people throughout everywhere he traveled. And he could make contact and make friends. Now he would he would return to Jamaica and try to start the UNIA. It had failed. And the UNI was based on a concept of self-reliance, ultimate nation. He would go to London, he would study. Still, the concept is self-reliance. While he was in London, something would happen to Booker T. Washington that would change Booker T. Washington's direction. I'm skipping a lot because if I did, did every detail of Booker T. Washington's life, would never get on. Booker T. Washington, on a lecture tour, sent a letter to the Secretary of the Treasury, Booker of uh, Tuskegee, who was here in New York, who was a white man. He was coming, him and Scott, the Secretary, sent a letter. And Booker T. Washington stopped in New York to see him. And Booker T. Washington stopped in the 80s to see the man. He wasn't quite sure what apartment he was looking, you know, in, in one apartment looked in another. Then uh, some white man in Europe came out and accused him from peeping in his apartment, calling his wife Sweetie. <laughs> and he, he wasn't even upstairs. They beat Booker T. Washington up. And Booker T. Washington went to court. He didn't want them to go to court. And, and Booker T. Washington treated that as a common criminal in New York court. And one thing Booker T. Washington said that his, 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 his white friends in the South would never have treated him that way. And he was right. Because in the South, Booker T. Washington was a piece of property. He was protecting the whites in the South from the black. Booker T. Washington was keeping them down, passing a little piece of money here and there. Any black school that wanted a little money had to get it through Booker T. Washington. Whites were giving money for black education, but it was coming through Booker T. Washington. So Booker T. Washington dictatorship over the train, the new training schools for blacks. But the fact that the money was coming to Booker T. Washington. The book he was training, was controlling the school system, was controlling higher education in the South and to be done in the back schools. Now you can see Du Bois is jumping on him now and fighting. And this fight was wrong, as wrong as the fight between Du Bois and God. Because what we needed at that time is what we need right now. Not a choice between Booker T. Washington and W. E. Du Bois. We need to affect a wedding between what both of them are talking about. A great education for self-reliance and the political use of the community and education. One was not contradicting the other one. One supported the other. It's just that Du Bois was premature. Du Bois was putting the car before the heart. Booker T. Washington was practical for his day and his time, and he's practical for this day. Now, had we followed the Booker T. Washington model, it would have led us logically to the Du Bois model. We didn't have to discard one thing to get to the other. Every time we needed a plumber in our neighborhood, we could have called a black plumber and we would have found one who was competent and reasonable. That's all he would say. There was a black person to fix everything we needed fixed. We could have maintained the community. And we could have grown into the trade union movement because of our skills. It wouldn't have been possible 
for the immigrant craftsmen to drive us out of that union. And the immigrant craftsmen drove us out of the AFL and subsequently crippled our uh, inroads in the CIA. Seattle. Seattle. Because we had not gotten trained on the new equipment in printing, the new equipment and building, and all we needed. But anytime this new equipment came on the scene, to be in on the apprenticeship of training. And the, the, the people who got in on this, they had no more brains than we had, and sometimes less, and sometimes couldn't even speak English language. So we did not lose out in skillful crowd jobs because of the lack of training and the, 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 the lack of brains or the lack of initiative. Because of the lack of, lack of training, and the new equipment, as the equipment changed, the equipment and printing changed, equipment, all these things changed. And what Booker T. Washington was trying to say that you, as they, we must keep up on these things. And we must keep our eyes open and, and watch. What he was training us for and telling us about is be abreast of everything that is necessary to go into the making of a nation. All right. <laughs> After the Eureka Fair, 1911, Booker T. Washington began to change his mind. Many blacks he tried to destroy, he began to make peace. He began to see less and less of his white supporters and care less and less about that support. He would now call Monroe Trotter, who had fought him. He would call Monroe Trotter again. And he would lend, lend Monroe Trotter $11,000 to save the Boston Guardian. And Monroe Trotter would tell him, no. Monroe Trotter had said repeatedly, I think Booker T. Washington is the enemy of the race. And Monroe Trotter would go in and take the 11000 and thank him and say, this saves the Boston Guardian. I appreciate it. My opinion of you has not changed one iota. <laughs> and as he departed, when he picked up his hat and departed, he turned back and said, Mr. White, I still think you're a disgrace to the race. <laughs> <laughs> he was defiant to the last day of his life. One of the finest journalists we produce in this country. Now, Du Bois, or uh, Washington's friend, defender, one of the writers of Washington's speeches, T. Thomas Fortune. Now, between T. Thomas Fortune and Monroe Trotter, these are two of the finest journalists we produce earlier in the century. T. Thomas Fortune would ultimately join Martha Garvey as the editor of the Negro World. And he would be the last of the great editors of the Negro world, T. Thomas Fortune. He became a Garveyite. Now, from a Booker T. Washington, I do a Garveyite. Booker T. Washington, no. Marshall Garvey wanted to come to the United States in 1950. Couldn't get the money together. But when he finally came in 1916, Booker T. Washington was dead. When he went to Tuskegee, he couldn't get along with Major Moulton and the crowd that Booker T. Washington left behind. And he comes back to New York. He was the first wife, Amy Ashwood. Now the talk about the two wives is separate lecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those were some strong women. Yes. The one thing he did do, he married himself some strong women. I met both of them at table. Both of them. Amy Ashworth brought Amy Jakes to the country to be Garvey's secretary. 
Amy Ashwood said that Amy Jake stole God from her. <laughs> and what these two women said about each other is, is something I've decided to leave out of it. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. I will not repeat it. <laughs> but he did not marry any weak women. I think both of them, whatever, were strong women. Aunt Amy Jake, the last wife, was the archivist of the Garvey movement, and she preserved the information about the Garvey movement. Amy Ashwood, the first wife, helped him build the movement and stood by him in those early years. So both of them deserve a place. There's only one book about Amy Ashwood who was produced privately by uh, Lionel Yard, who unfortunately died last week. His funeral was last Friday. But I'm saying that after Mark, after Washington's death, the concept of self-reliance re-emerged as part of the God movement. But this concept of self-reliance was international among African activists. But among common ordinary activists, it would appear again in the philosophy of Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. Every leader of consequence had to into the concept of self-reliance. And that the trouble Marcus Garvey had earlier, once he got his movement on the way, once Marcus Garvey was introduced by another great Caribbean figure, forgotten now, unfortunately. Hubert Harrison from St. Croix. One of the finest of the Caribbean mind sent to his country. Some of Fuller's intellectual tool Barbados. But I made a speech called the Caribbean Mind Away from Home, showing the contribution of Caribbean to the Afro American Freedom Movement from Prince Hall and straight down to the present. And I dealt with the fact that the finest minds the Caribbean could ever produce could never function in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And there's been a brain drain on the Caribbean from Prince Hall, who started out with Mason, Peter Ogden, who started the Art Fellow, Russ Wan, who edited our first newspaper. I mean, I just went through the whole catalog of with Caribbean figures who, who flourish away from the Caribbean, but who were not wanted at home, who couldn't function at home, even down to Walter Rodney, who went home and got killed. Um, then how the African American became the beneficiary of um, these men who found no place at home, including three great pan Africans. H. Sylvester Williams, George Padmore, and C.L. James. And a good book can be written on them and it can surprise you to know to what extent the atmosphere in the Caribbean then and now robs the Caribbean of that finest thinker. And my main point is that to a great extent, Marcus Garvey's years in the United States were years of exile. And after he went to London, his last year were years of exile. And if he were alive today and ran for an election in Jamaica, he would lose. If he were alive today and ran for election in Bedford Stuyvesant, he would win. Yes. Yes. That's a contradiction, but that's a fact. <laughs> now, 
Marcus Garvey's problem is not his trouble, but his indication of self-reliance began with his trying to structure community organization, even a black doll factory. Structure the equivalent in the United States of those social agencies that whites had. Black Cross nurses as against Red Cross nurses. Black Star Line. He discovered that shipping to Africa was so expensive and that he saw no reason why we should rely on other people to get to the continent of our birth. Why not go on our own ships with our own sea captains? Good idea then, good idea now. When you think of how many of us in the world The question should be asked, and least of all, the question should be debated. Do you know all, according to the United Nations statistics in the Jewish yearbook, all the Jews in the world are less than one half of the black population in the United States? No Jew will ever debate you over Israel. You can't even get a concession from one over whether Israel should or should not exist, and Israel is stolen property. You don't even get a debate as to whether Israel should or should not have an Air Force, or Navy, or Defense. And yet Africa has got 10 pilots. Ten by the Bible. What Marcus God was saying and dreaming so many generations ahead of his time was that Africa needs everything a nation needs or a cluster of nations need. And he started in 1921 with a scheme for Liberia. And the Liberians, then and now, literally a colony of the United States, were told to give Garvey the illusion that there was a possibility that he might be able to settle that. And to let him continue with the illusion. But it was not until 1924 that the Liberia let Garvey know that he was not going to settle that. But after this, Garvey had sent commissions. He had done everything right. He had sent not only more than $50,000, he had sent people who could build brick factories. He had sent people with skills that you need to build a nation. This man was serious. We were talking about self-reliance. He had sent the personnel to Liberia, road builders, brickyard managers, wheelbarrow, tool maker. This man's scheme had gone through. He could have transformed Liberia. Liberia was in the role model for what blacks Africans from the Western world could do for one half of the nation, and that would have been a role model for others, and independence in Africa could have come two generations ahead of, of when it did come. And yet those handkerchief head blacks in Liberia <laughs> obeyed Firestone and the American government, led God to believe that they were going to cooperate, their own cue from the United States told him they weren't going to cooperate and threw it all down the drain. Liberia was a sick nation when it started. It's a sick nation right now. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. They killed Garvey's greatest scheme. Here is why he was going to start the demonstration 
of self-reliance and cooperation between blacks in the West and those in Africa. Now, he's beginning to get in trouble about the ships and the stock. He suggests at this time he's having difficulty and he changes wives. That's always a difficulty. <laughs> 1925, he's convicted. The moment he's shot him, he's not released until 1927, he's pardoned. The different factions of the movement is fighting among themselves. They, would, they do not let him come back to the United States. They put him through the southern part of the United States, the New Orleans, and through Panama, and subsequently to uh, Jamaica. He goes back to Jamaica and tries to rebuild the movement, and, and tries to. <coughs> he still edits the, the Negro World, the Black Man magazine. In Jamaica, he gets terribly in debt. He runs for public office. He's elected one term. The second time around, the Light Brigade, we call it Light Brigade in the South, the mulatto group that he had offended, blocked him the second time around. And he can't take office because of the technicality, though he's duly elected. Now he's deep in debt and goes back to his trade. This tells you something about the character of Marcus Garvey. Goes back to his trade. He's a master printer. Goes back to work. Pays off of the debt. And finally, frustration. He is to leave Jamaica. For London. And when he's to leave Jamaica, the reporters want to know what do you have to say about Jamaica? He says, All right, yeah, I got a statement. Yeah, yeah. All right, gather around, gather around. <laughs> the reporters gather around to hear this magnificent statement, this statement. And then hush silence to Marcus Garvey makes one statement. Jamaica is a ridiculous country. <laughs> Both stop. Seven. Period. All he got to say. <laughs> no more. That's his that's this end of the interview. Jamaica is so complicated. <laughs> he goes to London thinking that his message might get across better. from the headquarters of the oppressor. And to some extent, in the magazine The Black Man that he edited from the 30s up until his death, 1940, that message did partly get across. He came to Canada about every two years. Fortunately, as a string of reporter, I saw him once. He was angry. He was bitter. He wasn't civil. He was disappointed in nearly everybody. They had given him every reason to be disappointed. Friends that he thought were friends had turned out to be no friends at all. The movement wasn't going well. It may have been the worst possible time to see him. He was hitting on bad times. The Italian Ethiopian War had bothered him a great deal. And he was scathing in his denouncement of Ada Selassie when Ada Selassie left and went and lived in England after the Italian occupation. And those last years, he continued to preach no one seemed to be hearing him. 
and illness more and more was taking away his energy. I'm looking at the second page of my lecture notes. It's many pages, and I should have known that I would never be able to cover all of this in any one evening. But my main point is that I don't think his message or the message of Booker T. Washington has gotten across to us. And the main message that needs to get across to us is the message of, of self-reliance. And this is a message that needs to be gotten across to African people the world over. Because until we understand that we are a cluster of nations scattered throughout the world, until we can bring African nations together throughout the world, until we realize that the slave ships brought no African people, brought no West Indian, brought no black American, brought no low yalas or high yalas. The slave ships brought nothing but African people. And we had to adjust to what oppression forced on us and that we have to come together as one African people. And that what Marcus Garvey said repeatedly, and what all leaders who understood our case, from David Walker in his famous appeal to Malcolm X, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad still misunderstood, to every leader who was true to his cause and really understood us, there has been but one message. And that is the simple message of confidence in oneself, belief in your culture, and belief in yourself and your people and making yourself over to be once more a world people understanding what you have given to the world and what you have given to yourself so that you can walk once more on the stage of history and be what you can. I think it is all in case in the simple message which God has repeated, up, up, united race, you can be whatever you will. Yes, uh, thank you. and thank you, the audience. Um, we'll take a few minutes break before we come for the question and answer period. Yes, I've heard of Kraft uh, Laney, and in my writing about the uh, the African woman, uh, 
big in world history, especially in the last part that I wrote about the impact of African women on education in this country. I wrote about her. Uh, she was a powerhouse in education, even to defending her, her, her institution physically. The Ku Klux Klan once threatened to burn her institution down. Yes, and she, and she just said it wasn't going to happen. She got on the gun and said, hey, listen, come on, if you're going to burn it down, just come on in here. <laughs> they didn't come see And they didn't come back. Strong woman, a great woman in education. Now, talking about the, the series, The Africa, narrated by Alan Azroy. This series is well done. No reason why it shouldn't have been well done, because they had five million dollars. Mm -hmm. And yet, it is an Arab whitewash, but unique, more uniquely done than a white whitewash. Arab, this man is implying that Africa waited in darkness for Islam to bring the light. Yes. Right. And what you have to understand, that Islam didn't even get to Africa until the 7th century AD. And that North Africa, North East Africa had been raped for a thousand years before Islam got there. And the last of these massive invaders to come to feed on the fallen body of Africa was Islam and the Arabs. And like all invaders, they took more than they gave. They came down the west coast, the east coast of Africa, married into African, African families and after two generations, because they were barred from the hinterlands, after two generations they created some black looking Arabs to show you how the misuse of the African woman. They used these black looking Af Arabs to start the Arab slave trade. And they desecrated that whole East Coast and destroyed, destroyed African cultures everywhere they went. They have no patience with African cultures and African religion. Alan Azaroy is half Arab and half African. He's catering to the, Af the Arab side of his family. He is descendant of Omani Arabs. The Omani Arabs were the worst of the slave traders. The Omani Arabs who controlled Zanzibar were so vicious until every time they saw an African, an African looked at one of the harem women, they would cut his head off and they would bury it and they would plant a magnolia tree over his body. If you ever go to Zanzibar, see a long line of magnolia trees. Each tree represents an African who made the mistake of looking at one of the harem women of an old man These are uh, Adam has a role his family. If you look at a book called The History of East Africa by Basil Davis, and look in the index and look at the word Mazaroy and look up that family. Well, the most vicious of the slave trading families along that coast. Now, this is a man that's interpreting African history, interpreting it principally from an Arab point of view. 
that series is being sold, being seen throughout the country, and it's being sold to school systems throughout the country, and they're buying it and using it. The unique thing about Adam Azaroy is that he gives you a few good things and only take away a few more good things. He is skillful, like all con men. He plays his game well. He plays on your gullibility, your need to be told something nice. He tells you something nice, then he tells you something bad, three things bad, then he won't notice. He distorts a great deal. Some things he said is an out and out lie. On the one that's coming up dealing with exploitation, which is supposed to be the most controversial one. They will have a series of people come, comment after the program goes off the air, and I'm supposed to be one of them. <laughs> now Basil Davidson did a series <coughs> that's far better than Adam Azeroy. A lot of people will buy Adam Azeroy's series, will not buy the Davidson series. The Davidson series was seen on, on cable. Davidson is white and Adam Azaroy is allegedly black. <laughs> <laughs> That's your trap. Explain that. Davidson has done the better theory. And Davidson, though white, every time he comes to a monumental period in African history, instead of Davidson explaining it, Davidson put an African on camera and let the African historian explain it. Something Adam Azaroy does not do. Then Davidson always referred to what was <coughs> happening in that country, in that part of Africa, a thousand years before. Davidson's background references are always good, because he said, this happened now, but a thousand years ago, this other thing happened. You always get the background. Now, I know Davidson personally and have argued with him about many aspects of African history, but he, in all fairness, is the best, not best European writer dealing with African history. Adam Azaroy said he met Sheikh Antadio really Africa's greatest historian until he died recently, the greatest living until he died recently. So he met him once a year for 10 years, and each time he argues with him about the blackness of Egypt. <laughs> Did you see anything about Egypt's con contribution to the history of Africa that whole series? You're not going to see anything about it. He passes over to Egypt hurriedly. Three pyramids, you see. Hmm? Three pyramids, you see. Yeah. And that's it. But you didn't see the step pyramid, which is the father of all step pyramids. He was then, it would have to be with M. Hotel, who was the father of intelligence, father of medicine. This series is one of the Big intellectual con game that played on the public. Now, it was done by an uh, alleged African, mainly with Jewish money. The Annenberg Trust of Philadelphia. It was an attempt to downgrade African history. Part of the money came from the National Endowment. The National Endowment wanted to disown that share. Now, if they could do this, Jewish money, an Arab commentator disguised as an African, who can they blame? Who can we blame? Well, they said, well, an African did it. What we do not understand, there are new black slave traders on the sea preparing to deliver us the new white slave master. And some of them are disguised as nationalists. Yes, sir. 
You better watch it well. <laughs> general history, European history, systematically prepare myself to teach history. And the formal PhD historian, when he came up against me, I was just so devastating because I had read things they never dreamed about. I could teach rings around. They had read the text. But I had read beyond the text, and those who differed with the text, I had read the radical literature which their teachers would even dare tell them to read. <laughs> then I paid to have things translated from other languages. And I had systematically schooled myself. When I couldn't go to high school, I found out all the books students would be reading if they were in high school. I went to second-hand bookstores and found and got the books and gave myself a high school education, including examination. And was giving myself a college education when I was drafted into the Army. And completed the education in the Army, came out of the Army with a GI Bill and went to college now, because I could go to college now with government expense. And I was so bored, those dull, dumb teachers <laughs> <laughs> who didn't know that subject, didn't know half about it as much as I did. And they got sick of me criticizing them, and they threw me out of NYU. Then I went to the New School for Social Research, and instead of Going to history classes, they let me teach history. <laughs> <laughs> then when they got tired of that, they told me, said, look, if you want to go to the front office, uh, you can go to the front office and pick up your degree any time you feel like it. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> All I do is walk in there and pick up my degree. I walk straight up out of the office and never pick it up. I said, I give out degrees. 